uh, honored to be here with Peace Action and with activists uh, around the country. Uh, what you're doing in terms of giving up your time, uh, your effort to fly into the nation's capital, to uh, advocate for peace, some of you uh, having spent time in North Korea uh, and others having been voices in your communities for peace, I have such uh, admiration uh, for what you do. And I have admiration because my own influence in politics was my grandfather who uh, spent 15 years uh, in uh, Gandhi's independence movement in uh, India and spent uh, four years in jail during the 1940s. So I uh, know the power uh, that grassroots activism and civic leadership has. I believe that's the only thing, whether you look at uh, the Gandhi's independence movement or Mandela or Dr. King, that's the only thing ultimately uh, that brings a lasting social change is the activism of people like you. So I uh, can't thank you enough. And I appreciate your being here when we are in the midst of a debate uh, about our policies towards North Korea. And I want to touch on that and then uh, open it up for your questions. I uh, criticized Senator Schumer a few days ago because his letter that seven senators signed literally could have been written by John Bolton. And I think our party needs to stand for peace and engagement in a new way of foreign policy. Not trying to constrain and criticize engagement with North Korea, much like we didn't shouldn't be criticizing engagement with Iran. Now, if you look at the history of this in the 1990s when Bill Perry tried and came so close to reaching an agreement, Perry basically had a agreement with the North Koreans that they would stop the intercontinental ballistic missiles. We were going to uh, pay them for some of the intercontinental bal ballistic missiles. He was trying to get beyond the 1953 armistice. And of course, it was a brutal war. I mean, we don't remember the war here, uh, and, but they do in North Korea. I mean, almost 20% of North Korea was uh, decimated, 20% of the population. And this is still uh, fresh in their memories if uh, you read some of Bruce Cummins or other uh, historians' accounts. So Clinton said, well, I want to get beyond the 53 armistice. I want to have a a peace agreement, a peace treaty. We're going to stop the fact of intercontinental ballistic missiles. And he was very, very close. And they also stopped or agreed to stop the enrichment of plutonium, which is what the United States wanted. And Clinton was so confident that uh, his successor would take up that diplomacy where he had done so much of the legwork. Uh, but of course, he turned out to be incorrect. The next thing we saw, North Korea was mentioned as part of the axis of evil with Iran, Iraq, and North Korea. And you wonder how did they get onto the axis of evil when we were attacked by Afghanistan and Al Qaeda? I mean, what connection did North Korea have? Now, does anyone know who pushed for North Korea to be included? John Bolton. I mean, one wonders. How many times do you have to be wrong in foreign policy before people stop listening to you? <laughs> no, it's just, it, it, it's a, you know, Napoleon, Napoleon once said, which I think fits John Bolton to a T, he said, it's worse than a crime, it's a blunder. It's a blunder. It's not that John Bolton uh, has had policies that have been disregarding human rights, it's that, it's that his policies have weakened the United States. They've been unpatriotic if you care about America's national interest. His policies don't reflect our founding values. They don't reflect Washington or John Adams who counseled restraint. He has really done more damage to American foreign policy and American security than perhaps any politician or political figure in the last 20 years. And there are a lot that you can put on that list. So, you know, Bolton comes in and he says, well, the North Koreans are not enriching, they're now enriching uranium. 
they're getting around the agreement. They had, uh, they've stopped enriching plutonium. And there's no doubt that the North Koreans were not being straight up, that uh, they were trying to be too clever by half. They had agreed to stop plutonium, and now they were going to enrich uranium. It was uh, consistent with the letter of the agreement, uh, but not the spirit of the agreement. But any normal response to that would be, okay, we got to go back to the negotiating table and tell the North Koreans that that's not uh, acceptable. But Bolton used that as an excuse to totally get out of the 94 agreements that, were, that Clinton had started, the framework, to label North Korea part of the axis of evil. And that's really when the relationship frayed and estranged. Now what happens is uh, we have eight years of that with Bush and then Obama gets in. And unfortunately in South Korea at the time Obama is there, you have hardliners elected as leaders of South Korea. So Obama does not have as much room to maneuver. One could argue that maybe he should have done a little bit more in retrospect to engage uh, North Korea. I'm not saying that the administration's policies were perfect. But you did not have a partner with South Korea. And then you had this courageous leader, President Moon, who really is, is arguably one of the strongest and bravest voices for peace uh, on the international stage today, the son of North Korean refugees, who runs on a platform of peace and reconciliation. I mean, it's not that he comes to this later on in his career when already in power. I mean, this is not a figure like Gorbachev, who is sort of a stealth person who brings peace, tries to bring peace. He runs saying, I want reconciliation. I want peace. Uh, why does that matter? Because he has a huge mandate from the South Korean people. Now, I'm, I have a very simplistic view, but one would think that the South Koreans would know most what was in their interest. I mean, they probably understand the consequences of nuclear war or war. I'm sure they're not naive to it. And they overwhelmingly vote to say we want engagement with North Korea. And then President Moon takes a number of risks. He says, I'm going to have the Joint Olympics and I'm going to uh, engage uh, North Korea in uh, diplomacy. And some of us in the Congress said this is exactly what President Trump should do. He shouldn't just be hurling insults. He shouldn't be talking about preemptive strikes and a bloody nose. He should engage with the North Korean with Kim Jong-un. And he should follow President Moon's lead. Well, guess what? Trump, for all his flaws, decides to do that. He overrules Bolton. He overrules a number of his neoconservative advisors, and he says, I'm going to go engage. Now, I believe the Democrats and the progressives should be applauding that decision and encouraging that decision, not piling on for partisan reasons and constricting his negotiation ability. It is just not realistic to expect that North Korea is going to have total denuclearization off of one meeting with the president. And I don't think, do I believe that Trump should have had better preparation? Yes. Do I believe that there should have been other people from our State Department going there to set up the talks? Yes. But do I believe that the fact that this wasn't perfectly handled means that we should criticize peace and criticize engagement? Absolutely not. You know, the foreign policy establishment always gets it wrong. You remember when President Obama was debating Hillary Clinton in the 2008 debate? And they asked, you know, would you sit down with any dictator or any uh, leader, and I think they mentioned Iran and a number of other countries, to engage in conversation for peace? And Obama said he would. And the entire foreign policy establishment said, oh, that's the end of the campaign. They're not going to trust him to lead. He doesn't have the qualifications to be commander in chief. Well, the people didn't think that. His poll numbers went up after he gave that answer, because the American people actually won engagement. They've, they've realized that we've spent $5.6 trillion in the last 18 years when you look at the costs of Iraq and Afghanistan. And they think, wow, we could have had 
health care, we could have had jobs, we could have had free public college, and we still would have had money left over if we hadn't gone in these interventions. And by the way, terrorism has spread since we've been going overseas. This is not national policy that has made our country stronger. And it has been a huge distraction from helping us innovate and compete for the 21st century, where you have China building the Silk Road and China engaged in policies to expand their influence, the real competition for global leadership. So our critique, you know, it's, our critique doesn't just have to be a human rights critique. Our critique should be a critique based on national interest. And that's why I believe so strongly that the president should have the ability to engage and to try to get progress. What could that progress look like? It could mean that he could have some agreement to stop uh, or to suspend intercontinental ballistic missile uh, development or keeping in North Korea keeping intercontinental ballistic missiles, similar to what Perry was trying to achieve. That would assure us, at the very least, that North Korea couldn't launch a uh, missile that hits our homeland. Or he could stop, have some agreement on stopping nuclear testing. Or he could have some framework for future meetings and a systematic engagement so we don't have error in getting uh, into war, where we have military to military communication, the type you have in uh, Syria at the, at the uh, line of demarcation there. So there are a lot of steps short of complete denuclearization that can be the outcome of this summit. And the role of progressives in Congress, the role of Democrats in Congress should be encouraging that dialogue, understanding that we aren't going to have or very unlikely to have a home run meeting of the minds on the first time that we're engaging. And understanding that we need to be not partisan when it comes to matters of diplomacy and peace, but put the country and the world uh, first and encourage any leader, even when we totally disagree with him on other policies, to succeed. Because that's what gives us credibility in leading with principle and not leading with partisanship. So the letter that we will be writing to the president with uh, Barbara Lee and several other progressives is to uh, encourage him to continue to pr uh, uh, pursue this diplomatic approach. And your voices in uh, making that case for continued engagement, continued diplomacy uh, in the peninsula is so critical. And then to articulate, as I believe the Democratic Party must, a new type of foreign policy for the 21st century, rooted in our values and, and aware of the challenges of the modern times. Now, what would that foreign policy look like? It would be one which says we, of course, want to engage in the world. It's not that we want to withdraw from the world. It's not that we are uh, subscribed to uh, a nativism or xenophobia that has marked at times uh, this president's policies. But it is that we engage and lead in the world through our technology, through our innovation, through our music, through our art, through our universities, through our culture, through our best parts of American traditions. That's what inspires people around the world. It's what inspired my parents to come here. It's what inspires people from around the world to still look to America as a place of promise and hope, that we should engage in helping with the fight against global poverty, engage with the fight on climate change, engage in the fight to have primary education for every person born uh, in the world. We have some of the greatest philanthropists in this nation, some of the most innovative work in terms of uh, helping humankind, some of the leading universities. Those are the ways that America ought to engage. And we ought to be far more restrained when it comes to our military. But this is not just the grandson of someone who served in Gandhi's independence movement. This is what John Quincy Adams told us we should do. This is what George Washington told us we should do when they founded a republic and were aware 
of the dangers of the colonial powers of Europe. They didn't want us to replicate that mistake. They said, if you go and have your military inv involved in foreign wars, you will be seen less as a liberator and more as a dictatorial force. That's John Quincy Adams, because he understood that you couldn't fight wars for freedom not knowing all the nuances in a particular region. And so he said America should always root for freedom. We should always support freedom with our values, but not with our military. There is an emerging consensus among Republicans and Democrats in the House, some of the new members, that the interventionist foreign policy that we have had, particularly in the last 20 years, when it goes to uh, Iraq or Libya, or regime change in Syria, or regime change in the Ukraine, has not served the American national interest. That we need to have a greater restraint in our military use of force, that we need to have greater support for the, the values that really define America around the world and engage on those metrics, uh, and that that would be far truer uh, to our foreign policy tradition and far more in the American people's interests. I believe that this is what most Americans want. And the reason I know that is because everyone, when they run for president, promises to get us out of the wars. <laughs> they do, and that's how they win. And then they get these advisors whispering things, you know, and then somehow they get deemed experts. I don't know what makes one a foreign policy expert. You don't need cunning to do foreign policy. You need a understanding of American values and an understanding of American tradition and history. So those are some of my uh, thoughts. I uh, welcome uh, taking uh, some of your questions and want to thank you uh, for your advocacy, particularly on this issue of North Korea at such a critical time in our nation's capital. I appreciate your question, Carol. And I, I agree with you that some of those senators are are, are very thoughtful, good senators. I mean, Sherrod Brown and I have a bill together uh, where we expand massively the earned income tax credit. Instead of Trump's tax bill, we would give $10,000 or $7,000 back to middle class families. And Sherrod Brown has been uh, a huge fighter for working families. And when I was going to speak out against Schumer's letter, some of, several people said, well, Ro, you're a first term member of Congress and he's the leader of the party. Why are you speaking out? And I said, isn't that what democracy is about? Since when do we have blind loyalty to people based just on their party or their position? Our founders used to go have huge vigorous debates with each other. Didn't mean they didn't like each other or respect each other, but groupthink has what, is what got us in to Iraq. Groupthink is what has kept us in Afghanistan for the past 17 years. Groupthink and the lack of progressive voices speaking out against neoconservatism is why our foreign policy is the mess it's in. And so we, we need more people speaking out. Doesn't mean that you can't respect people or you make things litmus tests about the entirety of their career. And people may have differences of opinion. But that's the democratic process. And I think when it comes to a new foreign policy, we need, we need new thinking. And my hope is that some of the pushback that people are receiving from that letter may get them to rethink uh, doubling down on that and may uh, make them more open uh, to a, a diplomatic, peaceful solution. So if Senator Menendez is out there saying that he wants to see peace, that's, uh, uh, that's a, a hopeful sign. I mean, I approach the uh, politics not with a cynicism, but you look at the great movements of history and they sought to convert people to their point of view. They didn't hold grudges against those who disagreed with them. And I think what we want to do is to convince the senators who were on that letter uh, that that is not the right approach and that they should reconsider it given their own values. This might be the last we can take a few. We can, uh, Sir? Yeah. Uh, Mark, and then we'll stick with two together. Let's start with Mark and then Ann. I just wanted to know, Mark, I just wanted to know. Thank you for having us here. Well, Barbara Lee and I, and Bar by the way, Barbara Lee and I have said this on the floor of the House. If, if John F. Kennedy were going to come back and rewrite the profiles of courage, there'd be one person in the House who would have a chapter, and that would be Barbara Lee, because she was the only person 
in the entire Congress who warn about us getting stuck and giving a blank check for the authorization of war uh, for 17 years that we've had given. And Barbara Lee has been tireless in trying to get that authorization revoked from 2001. So she and I are leading this letter in the House uh, to say to the, to the President, to say, we encourage you to continue to pro engage, to pursue diplomacy. We're supportive of that effort, uh, that, that, that he can count on progressive Democrats supporting uh, the effort of negotiation. Uh, we're trying to get uh, as many signatories onto that letter today. In fact, that's why Eric and Gio are working on, and we hope to get that out by, by the afternoon. Um, I, I don't know if there will be a House version supporting the Schumer letter. Uh, my, one of the reasons I spoke out so strongly uh, is because I wanted there to be some public uh, accountability for that letter to discourage other Congress people and senators uh, from going down that road. Uh, but, you know, my view is, and I've made this clear in the press and I made it clear to colleagues, we, we all, as citizens of the United States, as concerned uh, people with the fate of the world, we all ought to hope for these talks to succeed and uh, to continue engagement. Uh, could we get your help on three things? One, helping uh, lift the travel ban for U.S. citizens going to North Korea. Number two, can you help us with uh, uh, getting separated families the opportunity to go back to North Korea and number three can you help us with returns of remains of US military from the Korean War that are waiting to be returned the North Koreans already have them they just need the US to ask for them thank you thank you they all seem uh, very reasonable I mean obviously the returns of uh, our servicemen and women's remains is, is something that uh, we should be advocating and my guess is my sense is and you can come to our office uh, to discuss it in greater detail but i can't imagine why that would be a partisan issue i mean i would think that that should be something everyone uh, supports uh, i support uh, reunification of families and in terms of the travel ban my concern would just be uh, our safety but if we can do it in a way that uh, uh, is uh, uh, is not putting americans at at risk uh, then it's something to, to look into. And, that, and that's something that may emerge uh, out of this uh, conversation. And that's why I think it's so important that these three issues you mentioned are, again, issues that could be made, it could have progress, and we can't just insist on complete denuclearization as the benchmark by which to evaluate uh, the talks. So uh, you can follow up with our office. Thank you. We a couple more questions. And I wonder if the summit tomorrow leads to a process of normalization between the U.S. and North Korea. At some appropriate time, would you consider facilitating uh, exchanges between scientists and technology experts between North Korea and the United States, uh, maybe folks from, from your region? Sure. I mean, I, I, I think that the possibility and a hope for the 21st century is that we're going to have the type of collaboration uh, in technology and medicine and arts and music uh, in literature uh, that uh, will make this new century a, a unique one in, uh, in human history. And we don't want to replicate the Cold War. We don't want to replicate uh, the, the world wars. I mean, the 20th century was one of the bloodiest centuries in human history. And so if we can move beyond uh, the stalemate in North Korea and uh, have collaboration on uh, technology or science that can benefit humanity, uh, that is something that we want and uh, I would support. Now, obviously, it has to be uh, only after a framework of some uh, agreement and normalization, but it shouldn't be uh, something that we uh, dismiss and it should be something we work towards. Okay, one final question. question. <laughs> extraordinarily difficult. I feel like I've been working on Korea and North Korea for almost two decades, and um, we have obviously some um, bright lights, and it's, you know, this is the party for peace and engagement and dialogue, and I feel like the Democrats have been the most intransigent. There is uh, just this, like, you know, uh, let's just accept the narrative of vilifying North Korea and not willing to engage with our adversaries. And, and now we have a president, the unhinged Trump, that is willing to do it. And he has actually normalized 
that it's okay to talk to your adversaries. And so are we going to face a Democratic Party that is going to be our obstacle if he actually comes back with saying, okay, we're actually going to start maybe the process towards a peace treaty. That's what North Korea wants, and we want complete denuclearization. What are we going to do about Democrats that is, could potentially be a stumbling block? So I think that the... I am, I'm, I'm critical of the direction some of the Democratic Party uh, has gone in, in foreign policy over the last 20 to 30 years, but I also think that there are uh, hopes for the party. I mean, when you look at, uh, and I, I don't agree with everything, but when you look at Ben Rhodes and Obama uh, and how he won, uh, I think one of the key reasons he won in 2008 was his opposition to the Iraq War. When you look at uh, how well Bernie Sanders' campaign did, I think one of the reasons his campaign, it doesn't get as much attention, but was a greater restraint uh, in foreign policy and a greater call uh, for human rights. Uh, when you look at Howard Dean back in 2003, uh, there was an appeal to uh, standing up to, uh, to war. Even John mm -hmm. Kerry got his career started uh, opposing the Vietnam War. Uh, and so, you know, as we look at the 50th death and, uh, anniversary of Bobby Kennedy, and remember uh, by, by the end of his career, his vocal opposition uh, to Vietnam. Uh, and then, you know, Woodrow Wilson has a uh, mixed uh, history on Haiti and a number of issues, but certainly in the League of Nations had an aspiration of uh, self-determination uh, and uh, a recognition of human rights. And I forgot the person you know, I interned for, Jimmy Carter, uh, at the Carter Center. And Carter, I think, has been a, a voice for human rights. So there is a battle within the Democratic Party, as there should be. I mean, no, no party uh, it, it has uh, just one uh, view. And right now, the battle is between those who want a foreign policy based more on restraint and diplomacy and uh, uh, an engagement on things such as uh, jobs and the economy and innovation and education and arts and culture uh, and those who have a more traditional balance of power, uh, military interventionist uh, worldview. Uh, I believe uh, the view of restraint, diplomacy and cultural engagement will win. And I don't say this, I, I say this because I, I talk to young people everywhere and most of them uh, have that view. They care about human rights, they care about climate change, they don't, they are they may be oblivious to history and sometimes perhaps too oblivious, but they aren't burdened by history. And they want to collaborate. They want to seek a, a different type of world. And they're the ones where the energy, they're, the, they're going to be the biggest voting block in, a, in another uh, few years as uh, the millennials uh, start to uh, really uh, emerge. Uh, and we've seen, I think, uh, the type of citizen engagement in this country uh, more than I've seen certainly in my lifetime uh, since the election of Donald Trump. So I think, I'll end with this, I think all of you have the opportunity uh, really to shape the direction of where the Democratic Party is going to go. Uh, many times I think people feel these decisions are being made uh, in closed doors in, in Washington, and that's uh, not the case. I mean, politicians ultimately respond, perhaps sometimes too slowly, to where public sentiment uh, is taking them. And as you advocate on social media, as you advocate in uh, Washington for a new vision of foreign policy for the party, uh, not just on North Korea, but a, a framework that will uh, be a clear contrast to the broken foreign policy of the last 20 years, uh, I am hopeful that we will have that kind of a movement, just like we have ahead on economic issues where you see Medicare for all and jobs guarantee and other parts of an economic policy uh, that has been much bolder than we've had in the last 20 years. So thank you, thank you for your work, thank you for having me.